ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد This particular narrative that we are looking at now it is very popular among certain deviant groups but it has actually no basis whatsoever in the books of hadith this is why the scholars say in describing it hadha batilun la asla la fi shay'in min kutub al hadith al batta it has no basis whatsoever in the books of hadith this particular narrative idha sa'altum allah fasaluhu bi jahi فإن جاهي عند الله عظيم When you ask Allah ask him in the honor in my honor my station that I have because I have my station and my position with Allah is great Okay this particular narrative uh, <clears throat> is not authentic and uh, it actually doesn't benefit us to call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to mention in the station of anyone because you're not able to intercede uh, unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills that this occurs okay but that particular narrative we won't waste much time dealing with it we'll go to more important areas more problematic areas one such narrative that we have <coughs> which is uh, probably a uh, good to be aware of and this is a narrative which was collected by ibn abi shayba <coughs> it's collected by ibn abi shayba and hafiz ibn hajar al asqalani mentions it in al fath the second volume and he says this is from the riwayah of abi salih a man from malik ad dar He mentions this this is the way it comes in al-Fath. Wa rawa Ibn Abi Shayba bi isnad sahih min riwaya Abi Salih as-Saman an Malik ad-Dar wa kana khazan Umar. This person he narrates with a sound chain from Abi Salih, Saman from Malik ad-Dar. And he was the caretaker actually the person who was responsible for the stock or the uh, Baytul Mal and keeping account of the things that were there. He said, <clears throat> the people were afflicted during the time of Umar with the drought. And so a man came to the grave of the Prophet wasallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, istasqi li ummatik, seek rain for your nation. فَإِنَّهُمْ قَدْ حَلَقُوا They have been destroyed. So this person <clears throat> uh someone came to him in a dream and said to him to go to Umar ibn al-Khattab all right and uh the uh rest of the narrative um really is uh no concern really but what concerns us is that this person did this and he went to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam grave and he said ya rasulullah okay and uh, before anyone leave the narration is not authentic okay and uh, the statement of <coughs> we will see how to deal with the statement of hafiz ibn hajar al asqalani this particular hadith has been narrated from saif in uh, this is uh, another person um in his works al futuh this is the victories that the person <coughs> that was uh, who saw this dream was bilal ibn al harith al muzani one of the companions okay now this particular hadith is problematic or for this particular athar because it deals with the companions it is problematic for more than one reason one is because it was said that it was the isnad in sahih that it had an authentic chain 
This particular <coughs> statement is not correct simply because the person in the chain, Malik Adar, is, as the uh, ulama of hadith says, غَيْرُ مَعْرُوثِ adala wa dabt. That he is not known to be a just person and his, his ability to retain the narratives is also not known. This type of person really then is considered as majhul, especially when we only have one person narrating from him. Alright? And one of the conditions for the hadith being authentic is that, is that the person must not be majhul, that he should be known. And that his level of competency should be known as well. So if this is unknown, then the hadith of the person is not acceptable. Okay? And actually, one of the things that is pointed out here by the sheikh is something that is probably good for the students to be aware of. He said that the fact that half of the Ibn Hajr started the chain from Abi Salih, some man, then went to Malik ad dar This is something that the ulama of hadith do when they want you to take into consideration that someone in the chain is a problem. In other words, the narrative all the way up until this person is authentic, but after that there's a problem. So when a person looks at this narrative and he sees that it's not in Sahih, and he doesn't understand the way the ulama of hadith used to write down the literature, he says that the whole narrative is authentic and there is no question about it. But once you're aware that this actually indicates that up to this point here, and the name of the person is mentioned, to show that there is a problem from here on in, then you're aware that, okay, there is still a problem in this. The problem here is that this person is not known. Okay? And uh, so that makes the narrative unacceptable. And this was pointed out by Al-Haythami in his book, Mujma' al-Zawaid, where he mentioned, he said... <clears throat> That this particular narrative was collected by Al-Tabarani in his book Al-Kabir, in his collection. He says, and the narratives up to Malik al-Dar, thiqat mashhurun, they're trustworthy people and well known. Okay? Up to this point. As for Malik al-Dar, la a'rifuhu. I do not know him. Okay? So, <clears throat> this is one of the problems with the chain, that the person is considered mashhur and known. And one of the conditions for the narrative being authentic is that the person must be known. You must be able to say that this person was sound in memory, his character was such and such, and if you're not able to do this, then you cannot accept the narrative. Okay? <clears throat> also, when we look at this particular narrative, it actually goes against a number of things, really. It goes against the Qur'an. It goes against the Qur'an. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the people, اِسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ دُرَارًا Seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one who forgives. And if you do this, He shall send rain down on you. He will cause rain to come down for you. Okay? And this is exactly what the companions did. As we have seen in the time of Umar, that they would call Abbas and tell Abbas or Abbas, pray. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send down rain for us. And rain would come before the brothers leave the area. Okay? So that is what they used to do during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, <clears throat> this is what was known. Okay? This is what was known. Also, we have a narrative I mentioned earlier where the person who is, uh, who was mentioned in the chain was Bilal. Okay? That narration is from Saif. And so the scholars of Hadith says, La yusawi shay'an. This doesn't mean anything not equal to anything. And this is simply because Saifiyah, he is Ibn Umar. And there is an agreement, almost you could say a consensus among the ulama of hadith that he is da'if. Ibn Hibban says, يَرْوِي الْمَوْضُوعَاتِ عَنِ الْأَثْبَاتِ وَقَالُوا إِنْهُ كَانِ يَضْعُ الْحَدِيثِ 
that he narrates <coughs> fabricated narratives and say that it comes from people who are trustworthy. All right, and he used to fabricate hadith. So his mentioning someone's name is like he didn't say anything. His narration is worthless. Okay? And actually, <coughs> he is one of the people that is very often used in the books of history as a basis of narrating historical events. And so this is why I think the other day when we were speaking about the history books, okay, when people are narrating things, that you know, it is something that the believers have to be careful of, especially, you know, saying that these were things that actually occurred. But this is a problem, especially for the English-speaking uh, community, because a lot of the books have not yet been translated, and they have not been actually critically analyzed. So a person is really not able to say, well, this is sound and this is not sound. Okay? So we're at a disadvantage. Okay, this person actually, <coughs> Ibn Jurir, Ibn Kathir, and others used to mention his narrations a lot. Same thing with Lut ibn Yahya. Okay, he's one of the very popular people in terms of Islamic history. I mean, not in terms of him being a good person, but one who writes a lot about it. And uh, al Dhahabi mentions about him in his book, Al-Mizan, he says, Akhbar Italic. The same way like saying Halik. You know, he's destroyed, he's of no good. You know. Um, لا يثق به تركه أبو حاتم أبو حاتم and others you know says he's matruq don't even look at it and also Darqudni said he's da'if and others okay says so he is a Shia محترق صاحب أخبارهم he's a Shia who is burnt <laughs> burnt this is a saying when they say محترق he's like uh, he is actually totally biased in respect his madhab Okay? And no wonder we have some of those narratives pertaining to the period of the Khulafa that do not speak well about that period. When you have narratives like these coming from this type of individual. And this is something that Ibn al-Arabi tried to explain in his book. He tried to point out that a lot of the narratives that we have concerning that period of the Khulafa where it said that Ali did this and he was upset and such and such and he stayed away for such a long time. He deals with this from the point of the chain of narration and what was narrated authentically from them to say that these things, even though they're found in the books, what we have sound concerning them is not like this. Okay? This is very important because we say, well, these are Sunni sources. Okay? That are narrating these things. These are Sunni sources. All right? And this is why, may Allah bless the scholars of hadith, because they have done a tremendous job in preserving this area and warning people against these things that have been added to the, uh, the history of, of the Muslims. Okay? Muhammad ibn Umar, also who is well known as Al-Waqidi, all right? he is also one of those individuals who cannot be relied on. Okay? He is also Matruq. And he is one of the persons, uh, one of the individuals who uh, Ibn Sa'd very often narrates from in his tabaqat. So, it's just something that we need to be careful of when we see these names, if the brothers remember them. Okay? When you read these narratives uh, from, from the different books that have been translated and these names come up, perhaps they'll have some significance when you say, well, it, this is Lut ibn Yahya. This is Muhammad ibn Amr, al-Waqidi. Okay? I heard this name before. Yeah, be aware of it. Also, <clears throat> this particular narrative that we're discussing, the people are saying that you can mention the name of the Prophet wasallam and have your supplication answered. Or mention the honor that he holds with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually, it's something that they use in Arabic. The word ja, it's not like the Rastafarian word, okay? You're not talking about you know, the, the Iri people. This is something totally different. But <clears throat> this particular narrative doesn't deal with the discussion that we have here. 
Because it says that this person came to the grave and he said, Ya Rasulullah, istasqi lana. Ask that Allah give us rain. Basically, he's asking that the Prophet wasallam supplicate on their behalf. And uh, this was something that, of course, was not done during the time of the companions. And Ibn Taymiyyah in his book, al qaida Al-Jalila, he does a book on Tawassul. Okay? And it is very good. Ibn Taymiyyah in his unique style of scholarship, he deals with, with this particular issue. And he says, it was not becoming for the Prophet wasallam, or they did not. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam, nor any other pro- of the Prophets before him had legislated for the people that they should supplicate to the angels or to the Prophets or to the righteous. Okay? And seek intercession using them. During their life or after their death. Or in their absence. And none of them used to say, Ya Malaikatullah, O angels of Allah, seek on our behalf this particular thing. Or go and ask Allah to help us. No one used to do this. Go to the righteous, the graves of the righteous. Or to the graves of those people that were considered prophets and say, ask Allah to give us sustenance. Ask Allah to guide us. Okay? And they never used to go to anyone who died and say, Ya Nabi Allah, O Messenger of Allah, Ya Wali Allah, O Friend of Allah, Ud Allah Ali, O Supplicate to Allah on my behalf. What Ibn Taymiyyah is using here is something that he does very well. He acts, sorry, he uses the action of that earlier generation. Something that was agreed upon and it was known that none of them ever did. As an act of ibadah. To say then that if it was not done then, then it should not be done in this day and time. Okay? That it should not be done in this day and time. Anything like that. And so he goes on and he gives these examples of what we didn't find during the time of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ or the tabi'een. That these people didn't do these things. Alright? And it is known that they didn't do this. And they didn't go to the grave with a, with a piece of paper like they do. You know, in some places they write their little notes and they throw it in the, in the grave place so that the person who's dead might read it and answer and supplicate on your behalf out of their mind. But this is what they do. They still do it now. Okay? And this is simply because of this thought of theirs. That door has been opened up. Okay? This is the same thing that some of the, uh, the people before us used to do. Okay? He says this was not done. And it was not legislated by the Prophet wasallam that it be done. Okay? And so this is something then that should not be done. We never knew that the companions, any one of them did this. He says, وَكَانَ أَصْحَابُهُ يُبْتَلُونَ بِأَنْوَاعِ الْبَلَاءِ They used to be tested with all types of difficulties. Okay? After the death of the Prophet wasallam, At times with famine, at times the sustenance, of course, would would be so diminished at times with fear, the strength of the enemy, okay, the people moving back, transgressing. Not one of them went to the grave of the Prophet ﷺ or to that of Abiba or any of the Prophets and said, we complain to you about the severity of our times, the strength of the enemy, okay, or that people are now sinning and then saying to them, ask Allah on our behalf or for your ummah to provide us with sustenance to help them, to forgive them. This was not done. Okay? He says, <clears throat> and what is similar to this of innovations that have become a part of, of the people. Okay? So, <clears throat> this is something then, if it was not done then, it should not be done now. It is considered then an innovation which leads people astray. Okay? And actually, as a consequence of people allowing this, we find that people go 
and uh, seek refuge with other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in difficult times. In difficult times, this is what they do. For some reason, they have an affinity with the graves. And they feel a closeness with the people in the grave that they don't feel with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And uh, so that is something that we should uh, be aware of. The Shaykh says, <clears throat> whoever tries to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that he has not commanded using other than what Allah has legislated or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has legislated, he is following the path of shaitan. He is following the path of the shaitan. Like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sat amongst us. And he drew a line, a straight line, one line. And then he drew lines from the right of it and to the left. And he says, This is Allah's path, the straight line. Then he said, subul." These other lines are different pathways. Ala kulli sabila minha shaitan. At the head of every line, every path is a shaitan. Calling. He says, then he recited, وَأَنَّ هَذَا الصِّرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلَ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ And this is my path, straight. Do not, so, sorry, so follow it. And do not follow those diverse ways because they will lead you away from his path, the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, so those innovations it's something that you should stay away from. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلِ ادْعُوا الَّذِينَ زَعْمْتُ مِنْ دُونِهِ فَلَا يَمْلِكُونَ كَشْفَ الدُّورِ عَنْكُمْ وَلَا تَحْوِيلَ Call on whom you will other than Allah, they cannot remove harm from you or change your conditions. Only Allah could do that. Okay? And uh, <clears throat> Abu Tayyip, Shams al-Haq al-Azim, Abadi, in his book, التعليق المبني على سنن الدار قطني he mentions some of the things that used to occur and he says some of the most despicable things and innovations that we have is that people go out and start mentioning Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani saying Ya Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani and they start to call out to him okay and others. <clears throat> All of these things that they do. He says, وَمَا قَدُرُ اللَّهُ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ They have not actually looked at Allah as He deserves to be looked at. That they need to turn to His creation and not turn to Allah. He says, these ignorant people, don't they know that the Sheikh cannot harm or benefit them? cannot harm or benefit them and they're going to seek aid and have their needs discharged by going to his grave. Alayhi Allah bi kafin abda. Is Allah not sufficient for his slave? Hey. He says, Oh Allah, we seek refuge with you from associating anything with you and magnifying any of your creation. Actually, this is deifying any of your creation. Okay? In the, one of the other fatawa, these are books of the Hanafiya, and uh, they mention that whoever thinks that the soul of the, sh- of the Mashayikh are present and they know what's going on among the different communities, yakfur, has disbelieved. He has committed an act of kufr. Okay? <clears throat> And it mentioned in another book of the Hanafi, they says, Whoever, man, law tizawaja bi shahadati Allah wa rasulihi, la yan aqid an nikah. Whoever marries, and this is happening in LA, in Los Angeles City, whoever marries and saying, Allah is our witness and the messenger, the marriage is not complete. Okay? Wa yakfu. And he dis- commits an act of kufr. لِاعْتِقَادِهِ أَنَّ نَبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَعْلَمَ الْغَيْبِ Because of his belief that Allah's Messenger knows the unseen. Okay? And the Shaykh points out, <clears throat> similar to this is what people say in this day and time, 
when someone asks a question and they say, Allah and his messenger know best. Allah and his messenger know best. You know what's going on? Allah knows and the messenger knows as well. Okay? This is something that the earliest scholars very early criticized. During the time when the Prophet ﷺ was alive and the companions would question him, they would say, Allahu wa Rasulu alam. But after his death, no, Allahu alam. Okay, so this is something that we need to pay attention to because people still say it now. Allah and His Messenger know best. It's a statement of kuf. Okay, so some of these things that, you know, it's basically a reminder, but uh, it's something that we need to be aware. As the Prophet ﷺ taught us, an individual sometimes, he makes a statement. Displeasing. لم يتبين فيها يعني لم يفكر فيها he doesn't think about it. And he incurs Allah's wrath ila yawmi yalqahu until he meets him. Okay? So this is why you find <clears throat> that the earliest scholars, when they dealt with aqidah, they dealt with not only what you have in your head and the way you look at Allah's creation, his names and attributes, but also those expressions that people sometimes consider insignificant. Okay? Because expressions, they carry things a long way. And they have meanings that people take and run with it. So they would be careful to correct your understanding, your way of looking at things, and also the way you express yourself. Those attitudes. This is why the Prophet ﷺ, he was the first one who used to do it. Okay? When people said, Well, Abi, I swear by my father, the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تحلف بآبائكم Do not swear. Are your fathers. Man kana halifan, falyahlif billahi awli yasmut. Whoever swears, let him use Allah's name or keep quiet. Okay? And he mentions in one narration that this is an aspect of shirk. We will see that inshallah as we go later on and deal with those areas where words are sometimes <clears throat> aspects of shirk or you can say things that are considered aspects of shirk. Okay. <clears throat> there is another narrative, and this one is very popular among the uh, Mutasawwifa, among the groups that consider themselves Sufis. And this narrative is found in Adarimi. Sunan Adarimi. This chain of narration from Darimi, he says, Hadathana Abu Nu'man. And An Nu'man narrated to us from Sa'id ibn Zayd. These names. They have some significance, inshallah, in a few moments. From Amr ibn Malik, who narrated from Abu al jawza This is Aus ibn Abdullah. He said, <clears throat> The people of Medina were experiencing a drought period. And so they complained to Aisha, radiallahu anha, and she said, Look at the grave of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And make from it small little peepholes or little small windows like attic windows. Okay, through the roof all the way through the masjid and straight through the sky area. So, you know, there was an opening above the grave of the Prophet wasallam, straight through the roof. So, and, you know, the sunshine would come down into the place. <clears throat> إلى السماء حتى لا يكون بينه وبين السماء سقف until there is nothing between the sky and the grave anything there's no uh, ceiling he said so they did this and we received rain until the shrub started to grow the camels became fat okay تفتقت من الشحم they started to burst because you know like they were bursting uh, bursting because of the fat that they had. So much so that it was called the, the, uh, the year of, of, of bursting. <laughs> SubhanAllah. This, this particular narrative, brothers and sisters, is daif. Is not authentic, is weak. Okay? And, uh, <clears throat> the reasons why it is, first of all, that person that we mentioned, Saeed ibn Zaid, He's the brother, well, 
doesn't matter who, who's his brother. He is considered uh, da'if. He needs some weakness. According to Hafiz ibn Hajar in his book, at taqrib he said, Sudukun lahu awham. Okay? Sudukun lahu awham. He has some weakness in him. Yahya bin Sa'i said, Da'ifun. According to Sa'adi, he said, Laysa bi They consider him weak in hadith. Okay? And the Sa'i said, Laysa bi qawi. He's not strong. These are all statements that this particular narrative is unacceptable because of this person. There is another reason why this narrative is not accepted. And the person who is beneath him, uh, Abu Nu'man, Muhammad ibn Fadl, okay? He is a person who, in his later years, when he narrated something, he would mix it up. So he would mix up one narration with something else. And, you know. And this type of person, whenever he narrates something, unless you are aware that he narrated it before he started to mix up things. If you don't know that this narration is before that time, you cannot accept it. If you know that he narrated it before that time, you know, when he started to mix up things and this hadith with that one and have no relation. Okay? If you know that he did it, this was narrated before that time, then it's all right to accept it. Okay, there are many scholars like this. Abdullah bin Lahiyah is one of them. And some of the, narra- the, the, narrator, the narrators from him, uh, they narrated from him before he you know, got all confused and his books were burnt. You know. So they said, I don't know, we're not going to mention it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, there are some people who narrate from him, like Ibn al-Mubarak and others. Uh, that once he narrates on them, his narration is considered acceptable. But this particular person, you don't know when this particular narration uh, came. So he's another weak link in the chain. Okay? He's another weak link in the chain. And so it's considered not acceptable. Either of these two things would make this particular narrative weak. Alright? Would make this narrative weak. Also, <clears throat> this particular hadith, and this is something that the ulama do. They just give this possibility. Let's just say if it was authentic. Can it be used? And they say, well, this particular narrative is mawkufun ala Aisha. It is something which is considered mawkuf. And mawkuf meaning that it is something that the uh, companion did. And it was no indication that the Prophet wasallam said that this is allowed to be done. And when a person makes this type of ijtihad from among the companions and others disagree with him, he might make a mistake and he might be correct. This is a possibility. We've seen it in a number of narratives from the companions. Okay? When they do their ijtihad, they make a mistake. All right? And uh, they'll be corrected. All right? So this is something that is natural. So it's not something that you looked at as being binding, even if it was authentic. So, this particular narrative, anyway, is not considered acceptable. Now, one of the things we pointed out earlier, we said that Ibn Taymiyyah, he does something that is unique. He looks into, and he was very aware of, the life of the companions and the Prophet ﷺ. And you see, very often in his fatawa, when people differ on issues, he he goes back to the seal and he says, well, you know, this was not the case during that time, so this was not possible. For example, he deals with this issue here. And he mentioned how the room where Aisha radiallahu anha lived was and how it was built. And that from the time the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died until Aisha radiallahu anha died until after that there was never anything built, sorry, open from the roof of the home of the wife of the Prophet ﷺ to the masjid. Okay? The only time they did this was when <coughs> walls were built around the grave of the Prophet ﷺ, that a little thing was left open. This was after the death of, the, of Aisha radiallahu anha that they used to leave open to go and clean the chamber. He said, well, so this particular thing looking at the reality of what occurred during that time is a lie. 
is a lie. And this is something that uh, is something that is, is very good that you find in his books. Okay? And he, he does this very often. He goes to what was known, the Tawatu, I mean with the continual chain of narration. And he says, no, this was something that was so well known and reported by basically everyone that this particular thing here is known to be a lie. Alright? So that is something else that he looks at <clears throat> and uh, points out. And he also mentioned, he says, worship, all of it, is based on following and not innovating things. Worship is based on following and not innovating things. It is not lawful for anyone to legislate in Allah's deen other than what Allah allows. It is not lawful for anyone to pray towards the grave of the Prophet wasallam, saying that prayer is better done in that direction than any other direction. Even though this might sound logical. Says why? Because the Prophet wasallam said لا تجلسوا على القبور ولا تسلوا إليها Do not pray on the graves and, not pray, and do not pray in the direction of the graves. Okay? And he is mentioning here then that once you have evidence that you follow what the Prophet ﷺ taught us and you put aside what you might think to be correct because we know what the Prophet ﷺ saw, said I have not left anything that would cause you to get into Jannah except that I have explained it to you. And nothing except Nothing that will lead you astray, astray except that I have warned you against it. Okay? I've warned you against it. So there is no need to innovate in the practice of the deen. And this is something that people have done. You know. And uh, the Sheikh mentioned some of the things that were there during his time and still are found in this day and time. He said, for example, we find some mystics praying towards the graves of their shiyukh. Turning their backs on the Qibla. Okay? And saying that this is the Qibla of those who are special. That is the direction of the grave. And that the Kaaba is the Qibla, Qibla to Amma. The Kaaba is the direction towards which the general common people turn. <laughs> Out of their minds. Some others say that <clears throat> Salah around the graves of the saints is better than the Salah in the masjids. Masjid al-Haram, Masjid al-Nabawi, and Masjid al-Aqsa. Okay? Others think that to supplicate in those areas are better. All of these things are misguidance. Alright? And it is only because you open the door to those deviant concepts based on those fabricated narrations that these doors are opened up. And this is why it's important when we deal with narratives from the Prophet wasallam that we, we are more sure than not that it is authentic. Otherwise, very often they're the cause of the opening of a lot of evil things that we experience and suffer from in the Ummah today. Okay? Like these folks here doing. And, uh, you know, he said, when you think about it, these people who, follows the, who follow their desires. He says here, we should know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent his deen down بتحصيل المصالح وتكميلها Allah has sent down his deen with that which will benefit mankind in the best of ways. وتعتيل المفاسد وتقليلها And that which will move away from them harm and that which causes it and to reduce it. Okay? So these areas then, <clears throat> where people consider that they can come and introduce something that is better than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us and what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has left, these people are in a state of misguidance. One of the things also that uh, the uh, Shaykh points out here, he says that this book, uh, Adarimi, sometimes the people call it 
Musnad al Darimi. This is for so the brothers who are who are into the study of hadith. Okay? And this is not correct. Actually, it's the Sunan of al Darimi because it comes like that with the different chapters and the different. Uh, Chapters actually that are according to subject matter that you find in the books of fiqh. And also they call it Sahih al darimi The authentic book of darimi This is also not correct. Okay? And this is something that we need to be careful of. Because we have a statement concerning the books of hadith. They call the six books. As-Siha as-Sitta. The authentic six books. And this is not correct. Because you have in some of those books the only two books that we have that were specifically gathered with the purpose of only having authentic narrations in it was Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Tirmidhi, Nisa'i, Abi Dawood and Ibn Majid, Sunan al-Darimi, Al-Bayhaqi, Tayalasi and all of the others, they have in them strong hadith, they have in them weak hadith that are considered hasan, hadith that are considered weak, and some that are considered fabricated. Okay? Alhamdulillah, these books have been uh, dealt with in this time as they have been dealt with in other times where the scholars point out the weakness in some of the narrations so that you will be aware of it. Okay? But still it is difficult for the student and for the brothers and sisters who don't have access to the Arabic uh, to find this out unless of course these books are translated and only the authentic narrations have been translated. Other than that, you know, uh, it is better when depending on, on the uh, sources to use Bukhari and Muslim. Okay? Because those are really reliable. Unless, of course, you have some book that has been authenticated and you know the weak one from the strong ones and what have you. So this is a mistake that they do in saying that, oh, you know, I read it and it's a hadith. And a person says to you, well, that hadith is fabricated because it, it's, it's, it has in the chain a person who's known to be a liar. He said, but I read it. It was narrated by a Sahabi. And this is something that caused a problem because, you know, the Sahabas were not liars. But they don't understand that beneath the Sahaba, you have a whole chain of narrations, sorry, narrators. For example, you may have Muhammad, Abdul Wahab, Ali, and so on, until it came back to Dawood. That whole chain of narration, you may have six liars in the chain. Alright? That's, that's normally not the case. I've never seen anything like that. But just to give you an example, you could not say then that the prophet. You tell them, brother, you know, that's not the best thing to say. Because of. Well, you explain to him why. Okay, you tell them, well, brother, you know. <coughs> All these affairs that we're dealing with now, the Prophet is not aware of. And <clears throat> a statement of yours is in fact saying that his knowledge is on the same level with that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though he's dead. Yeah. And uh, for that reason, you shouldn't say it. I tell you, brothers, you know, if you ain't got no questions, no forces. Well, <clears throat> one of the things, the, the question is, what is the purpose of a da'if hadith? Why is it that you find it in some of the books? Originally, the intent was to warn the people against it. Because writing the name of the person in the chain then would make you aware that these people, oh, you have this one in the chain, be aware of this narrative. Okay? With the passage of time, that knowledge, of course, is not as it used to be. And so, you know, you don't even have the books now in the chain of narrations because it really doesn't make any difference to the readers. So the best thing that could be done is that the hadith that are authentic be presented. But for the student, <coughs> a hadith which is not really seriously weak might be of some benefit. I'll tell you why. You may have one narration where a person is considered weak. All right? And he is weak because, you know, he confuses things every now and then. You may have a similar narration from another chain 
where a person in that chain of narration is also weak, but he's not seriously weak. He, you know, every now and then mixes up again. But he now supports what that weak person over there says, who is not seriously weak. So now you are getting strength to this particular narrative. You get a third different chain with a different set of shiuch, another, but you have any, you know, someone who's, every now and then he makes a mistake. The strength of that narration is now increasing. The strength of it is now increasing. And what you have actually is <clears throat> if you don't have those different chains, if you don't have those different, uh, I'm going to call them chains, all right? And you only have this one chain, then that narration is unacceptable. And you cannot say, call on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You cannot say the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Okay? And if you do, you will be in danger of coming under that warning of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, whoever says about me what I did not say, let him prepare his abode in the fires. Okay? So, <clears throat> it was like then a warning to the people. You see in this... This particular, you have Atiyah al-Awfi. And he says, from Abi Sa'id. Okay, we saw that this person, he was actually real devious. Because he sat with the companion whose name was Abi Sa'id. And once Abi Sa'id died, he sat with a person who was a liar. And when he wanted to, to refer to him without you knowing his name, he would give him the kunya. Abi Sa'id. He would call this liar Abu Sa'id. <laughs> Alright? And uh, so, you know, when you have people like that and you see his name in the chain, you say, forget it. So, like that, you're able to, um, it's, it's like a warning. And actually, it is a whole science in itself. Where they have books about the people that narrated hadith, that they call Kutubur Rijal, books concerning the men about their lives, who their shiyukh were, their teachers were, who their students were, who narrated from them, who they narrated from, where they were, their father, their mother, you know, the time when they died, which tabaqa they were in, in other words, <clears throat> where they're associated in terms of their lifetime, that time period, whether they're from the sahaba or tabi'in, or between those two, okay, because they, differ, they make a distinction between those people who saw a whole lot of the companions, and narrated from them. And then those who are shorter and smaller than those. And then those who are lower than those, like the Zuhri and others. Okay? And then you have the others that are considered other levels. They have all of those classifications. And they have their own purpose for that. Okay? And all of these things are to be found in books. So you can actually go to the Hadith. In the Sunan of Abi Dawood. And where it has the chain of narration. Okay? You can check it out and see, well, this person in here, what has been said about it? All right? Okay, he's such and such, such and such. You go to the second person in the chain. Oh, he's also trustworthy. Third person. Ah, who half him. Thicker, mutkin, abid. He's a person who's trustworthy, sound. He perfects his hadith. He's a worshiper, a person who, in terms of his deen, he's upright. Then you go all the way to the sahaba. If you have those people in the chain, they say, it's nadahu sahih. Its chain is authentic. Alright? And uh, that can be done in this day and time. They're still doing it because the books and the sources have been preserved. So we have in respect to the teachings of our Prophet wasallam, which most people don't have with their religious books. I'm talking about the hadith. Alright? That was sent to the Jews. Well, when... <laughs> when the uh, when Isa alayhi salam and all of those prophets were alive, they had their sunan, okay, their ways, and these things, of course, were not preserved. And there is a lot of wisdom behind that. It's like their scriptures have been changed, okay, and <clears throat> there might be in their books a lot of things that remain that are sound in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. For example, there might be relics of the truth. All right? We know the book has been changed because Allah mentions it in the Qur'an. 
okay? And they used to change the book and write it with their own hands after they understood it to be Allah's revelation and after they comprehended its meanings, they would change it. So this was done. And this, for this reason, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, if they, the people of the book, narrate to you, لا تصدقهم ولا تكذبهم Do not say you're speaking the truth and do not say you're lying. If you don't have any evidence, for example, from the Qur'an, that this is a lie, or from the Sunnah, that it's a lie. Because they had truth. Alright? But in this day and time, you don't have any sound sources to say, well, this was a Sunnah. Only if we have it, for example, through the Prophet ﷺ. If this is something you can say that Isa ﷺ did or did not do. Okay? No. Mm-hmm. Well, that is to show the strength of the narrative. Yes. And I wanted to quote a hadith for you. You have a hadith, for example, which Bukhari narrates from Hisham ibn Ammar. From Sadaqa ibn Khalid, from Abdul Rahman ibn Yazid ibn Jabir, okay, from Atiya ibn Qais al Kilabi, from Abdul Rahman ibn Ghanam, from Abi Malik or Abi Musa al Ashari. They narrate from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, "لا يكون لنا من أمتي أقوام يستحلون الخمر والحرير والمعازف الحرر." والحرير والخمر والمعازف. <coughs> This particular narration says that there will be a group of people who, will, who shall seek to make lawful the following things. Illicit sexual relation, fornication or adultery like we have going on in, uh, here in L.A. and in New York City and all over, you know. Where a person goes in the room and says, Allah is my witness, be married. Or a person taking a sister for his right hand possession, a free Muslim, and say, you know, you're my right hand possession. You know, and things like that. The Prophet ﷺ prophesied that this will occur. Harir for the men. Khamar, that people will drink it and call it by other names. This is extremely significant, especially in the Arabic where khamar, you know, As that the people now call it whiskey and liquor and brandy and, and you know the name in Arabic is Jays. Okay? Hey, Jays. an appropriate name. Mm. Now, and also the word Ma'azif. Ma'azif actually refers to every type of musical instrument. Including, yes. Okay? There are specific narratives also from the, on the authority of Abi Malik and Ashari which deals with the, uh, the tumbur and the tabal and these other types of drums. Okay? So, this particular hadith then, it has the chain of narration like this. And Bukhari mentions it in a way where he says, Qala, he said, from his sheikh, Hisham ibn Ammar. When Bukhari does this, this particular way of expressing himself, It is like normally there is a miss, a missing person in the link, in the chain. Okay? And normally this would be a defect in the narrative. Especially if a person is a mudallis. A mudallis is an individual who tries to make you believe, you know, that he heard something from someone that he didn't hear from. Bukhari, rahimahullah, was never described as being a mudallis. May Allah have mercy on him. And so this was his sheikh. So him saying qala is just like saying hadathana. It's just like he said he narrated to us. Okay? So it really doesn't prove to be a defect in the chain. But he presents it. And he presents it in this way for a number of reasons. One reason is that the sahabi, the person narrating from the sahabi, was not sure of the name of the companion. Whether it was Abu Amr 
or Abu Malik al-Ash'ari. This doesn't prove a problem because all of the Sahaba are considered trustworthy individuals. Okay? But Bukhari being so critical as he was, very often he would do things like this. At times he would do this, especially when a similar chain has been presented before in his book, his Jami' al-Sahih. Okay? Then he would do this because he said, okay, you have seen this chain over and over. Let me just start from here. So the hadith then is authentic. Alright? But these are some of the reasons that he would do this like this. Alright? And then he would present it for you so that you could look and say, well, okay, this person here, Hisham ibn Ammar, he's a trustworthy person, his character is sound. Sadiq ibn Khalid, also impeccable. And all the others in the chain. Okay? Once you have a situation like this, and you hear him saying, there will be a group of people who will seek to make these things lawful. Illicit sexual relations, silk for men, alcoholic beverages to make it halal, and musical instruments. Then you know that this is something that you could base deen on and your law and say that these are things that you should stay away from. So he presents that. Of course, this is of relevance to those who have some understanding of this science concerning the chain. Okay? And uh, it is like a principle. It is like a principle, this particular narrative. Once you have a statement that is so general like this, then what you need to do is to find out, are there any exceptions to this rule? And once you find out, okay, there are occasions when the Prophet ﷺ allowed certain things to take place, the exception can never be used now once again to set the basis for the rule, the general rule, because it is an exception. Because it is an exception and not the law. Because it is an exception and not the law. Hey. No.